This is a University of Otago podcast. Kia ora koutou. Uh, I guess I'm going to reiterate a number of the points that, uh, that Mark has made and maybe extend one or two of them. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about open educational resources. Uh, in contrast with their original purpose, it seems to me that uh, concepts like intellectual property and copyright are introducing barriers to the dissemination of knowledge rather than enhancing it. And Creative Commons licensing is, has been introduced as one way to help us break down those barriers and break through the barriers that have been introduced recently. The thing is that Creative Commons licensing has to be applied to something and Open Educational Resources, or OERs, provide us with one example of how Creative Commons licensing can be applied. Mark has talked about this in, in his own way in his talk on um, Creative Commons licensing, so um, I'm just going to go through and talk about a few of these points. I think 2002 must have been a pretty good year, because Mark mentioned that was when the first Creative Commons licensing came about. It was also when the term Open Educational Resources was first used. It, it arose out of a UNESCO workshop that provided this definition of open educational resources and the aim of the workshop was to, to figure out ways in which educational resources could be available to a much wider audience. They were at that time the province largely of what's known as the north and the question was how can education be extended to the countries of the south. And so the term open educational resources came into being and a definition was created which I've broken down pretty much as you see it here. Open educational resources are open in that they're free and they're freely available. They're obviously educational in that their principal use at that time anyway, back in 2002, was for teachers or lecturers and for educational institutions. And they were to be used primarily for course development they're resources of all kinds, lecture material, I've got them there, references, simulations, experiments, curricula, teacher's guide, uh, you name it, whatever it seemed like an educational resource, we wanted to make that open and available. Things have moved on since then, it's only eight years, but things have definitely moved on, but there are still five characteristics, really, of an open educational resource. The key one, I suppose, is that it's free and it's freely available. But then there are others. Open educational resources are modular. Open educational resources are available online. They can be designed for any educational level and of course they are designed to be reusable so that they can be used again, obviously, and again, and again. So, with that in mind, in a sense, we have an idea of what they are. The question is, where can we find them? Whoops, better use that one. Um, institution, uh, open educational resources can be found largely on, on repositories that are online. Um, Mark has mentioned where a, a number of these things can be located through search, through ways of searching. I want to point to a couple of examples. Um, the MIT Open Courseware project is perhaps one of the most famous, and it's become known as the first generation of open educational resources. The material that is available through the MIT Open Courseware project is largely designed to support that notion of course development by other institutions. It's there primarily for that use. The second generation, perhaps, is represented by the UK Open University's Open Learn project, and in that the UK Open University is putting whole self-instructional courses online. They're taking their courses, they're putting them online for people to use, for learners to take advantage of. Their material is online. But it's not just there for the learners, it's there for any institution that wants to download it. They can, and some do. So there is a, to begin with, there was a very strong institutional focus on open educational resources. However, what's happened more recently is that a number of in individuals have developed websites in which they are slowly aggregating information, educational resources, such as the one I've got up there um, from Ed Informatics. And on that particular site, it's possible to see a huge range of little applications that can be designed to illustrate concepts from physics and mechanics and, and others, other sciences like that. 
They're wonderful little applets that anyone can use, provided, of course, they obey, a, adhere to the terms and conditions of their use, which are licensed under Creative Commons. And they're quite amazing, too, and you should go and have a look at them just for fun. Um, the other thing that's happening along those lines, however, is a number of sites that have been spawned by the social software revolution, such as Flickr, that, that um, Mark has mentioned. Flickr is a, a, an, an image repository, effectively. The, um, the graphic you see there of the, the building, which I think is a rather striking building, was one that was taken from Flickr. So there are a number of ways in which we can um, find open educational resources and um, they're available to all of us. The thing that's interesting is to see the move that's happened. The move that's happened is from open educational resources as resources for lecturers and institutions to use primarily to support course development, which still happens, to a movement now which sees a much wider audience. Learners have taken to open educational resources. They think that they are something they can use and they think that they are something that can support and complement the course material or the lectures that are given in their own institution. And as an example of this, I'd like to point out that where the MIT Open Courseware project was originally designed purely and simply for lecturers and institutions, now that, that use amounts to only 16% of the access to those resources. The other 84 is undertaken by students. So there's been a change from thinking purely of open educational resources to thinking of open learning resources as students take advantage of the ways in which these resources can be used. So I guess what I want to do is um, wrap up by asking what it means for librarians and perhaps for academics. And I come to this as uh, someone who has an academic background. I certainly don't have a, a library background of any kind. And I also come to this as someone who assumes that students are going to keep using these resources and they're going to want to know things about them. So I've modernised Carlyle's statement that a true university is a collection of books. And, and we've got it reading now, as, as I think is the case these days, that a true university is a collection of information resources. And I, and I recognise that libraries are those already, but I want to widen that definition, to think that libraries and the staff in them should know about open educational resources and should know things such as what open educational resources are, where it's possible to find good quality and perhaps sometimes peer-reviewed open educational resources, to know about how to use them, and perhaps finally to know about the terms under which they can be used. And so in a sense we've come full circle back to the comment that Mark just made about uh, Creative Commons licensing and thinking about the ways in which what's in involved here is a change in attitude rather than anything else. So thank you very much. <laughs>